So here's my question, my first question. It's, it's not on the screen. It's, it's, a, it's another one um, that I'd like you to consider. What if Jesus were to pick you up tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and to take you somewhere for a few days, just a few days, the two of you, Jesus picks you up 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, where do you think he would take you? These are just questions for you to ponder. Where do you think Jesus would take you? And what would be two or three things he might talk with you about? And why would, would he do that? And thirdly, this is most important perhaps, what car would he be driving? I mean, that's important. You don't want to minimize that. For those of us who think cars are more than colors and, you know, toasters on wheels, appliances that get us from place to place, the car is important. So, Jesus picks you up tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Where do you think he would take you? What would be two or three things he might talk with you about? And what kind of car, what car would he be driving when he picked you up? So I asked those questions uh, not long ago to some people, and here are some answers they gave me. He would pick me up in a red Ferrari because we're fun like that. We would go to the national park nearby and take a beautiful walk through ancient cedar trees. A conversation would be about long-term perspectives, and then we would talk about the birds and the ants and the crickets. It would be a time of long-range thinking ahead and of settling into the day, and I would have so much gratitude. I'd have so much thanksgiving. Another person said, Jesus would take me to a familiar sunny beach to see my beloved wife who went to be with him in February of this year. The reason why is to mend my broken heart and to let me know how well she's doing in his loving care. Jesus would wrap his arms around me and talk to me about his great love for me. Jesus would finish by reassuring me that he is always with me and that he is everything I need for life. And he would then drive my wife back to heaven in her favorite car that she owned, a pristine, shiny black 1990, uh, 1990 Mitsubishi Eclipse GSX all-wheel drive sports car <laughs> with black leather interior to show me how happy and cared for my wife uh, that he, he's doing with her. And I thought, there's a guy who likes cars. He described everything. Someone else said, uh, he would take me to the little restaurant at our local private airport. We would sit at one of the tables outside as close to the runway as we possibly could without danger. Of course, he'd take care of that too. He would explain why I should no longer allow the opinions of others to shape my life and how to really accept his thoughts over me. What kind of car would he be driving? A red Ferrari like Magnum on Magnum P.I. <laughs> Sorry to all the car-building nations out there, but there's only really one car, the red Ferrari. And then another one said, Jesus picks me up every day and takes me for a ride. I'm the car he drives. Yeah, well, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Someone else said, he'd pick me up in, the, in a minivan or an SUV knowing that I have difficulty getting in and out of anything lower. So much for the Ferrari. I feel he would remind me of how he's always been with me through thick and thin. He would counter my feelings of worthlessness and uselessness with his life and perfection. But I think I would just be basking in his presence, listening like Mary, as he takes me to places I have always desired to see. And another one said this, I don't care what he drives, just pick me up right now. I could feel the grumpy in there. Someone else said he'd pick me up on a yacht and we'd cruise around some beautiful, beautiful islands. And then we'd laugh our way through lunch and all my cares would disappear in the security of his ease and joy to be with me. I like that. I've given you this exercise to help you think about how Jesus is with you. What the Holy Spirit is like with you, and to raise your, your wonder of what being with Him is like since it's all the time. And if He might talk with you about some things you've been believing that aren't true, lies that are injuring you in light of what the truth is since we live by the truth. If Jesus is the perfect caregiver, 
and is bothered by the lies that injure you, and if it's true that Christians live by faith and the grace of God, then consider the following question that you'll see on the screen. What plagues Christians and wears us out a lot? Believing that we fit in this world's current of ungrace and swimming as if our lives will be measured by ever-improving personal bests. Swimming in the current of this world, which is a current of ungrace, anti-grace. You don't get anything for free. You don't have anything from God. It's the message of try harder, do better, do more. But we know that this is not true. And so today, in part two of our series, we'll talk more about what would I do if I knew something from God. And last week, we looked at the kind of framework for our, our series, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Would you read that with me? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. That's who we are. We're new. We're not old. We have no resemblance to who we once were, at least on the inside, perhaps on the outside, but not on the inside. We saw that there are three truths that must go together and stay together for the Christian. Number one is grace, meaning that you have been given everything you will ever need to begin with by inheritance. God uh, himself in Jesus earned it all for you, keeps it all for you, and brought you into himself there to share all that he has with you at all times on every occasion, every day. It's all yours to begin with. You don't have to earn anything as you go. It started at start, the day you received Jesus. Grace at all times. Number two, the life of God. This isn't just a, a do-over that's not that kind of life, a second chance. It's God's life, it's Himself come to live in you. We talked last week about how that, that works, this, this inner animation that at one point was dead, had not life, but now has life, the life of God, which was His purpose to come and so that we might have life, His life, God's life. And getting used to that takes some doing. Would you agree? It's not always that easy. That's why we had new urges and, and new uh, directions, new desires after we received Jesus. Because we actually received Jesus. We received life, His life in us. And that's going to in influence us. And we live by then by grace, the grace of paying attention. And the grace of number three, freedom. 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 That God works to make sure we are free so that this new life in us may be found by us who live without fear, and then we can explore it and, and adventure with God in us for the, all that goes on around us. It's such a grand thing. These three things, if you'll keep them together, or God will remind you of them, grace and the life of God, and freedom, that that's what He's doing, then it'll expose anything else as not true so that you live by grace. You live by the life of God, and you live by the one who works for freedom at all times to keep you from anything less than that. This is this new life we have, the, the exchange that, that happened because of God who took from us all that was dead and gave us His Life. And this is why if you tried to look for your life, you couldn't find it with God because it's hidden with Him, we saw last week, hidden with Christ in God. Why is that significant? Because it's not, it's, it's not um, distinguishable from God's life. It is His life. He gave His life to you. So if you were to go try to find your life without Him, how much success, success would you have? None. That's why the purpose of life is to know God, who is life. That's the purpose of life. It isn't to get stuff right, do things well. It's to know God in you who is life so that He can do life and, and that in all of your days. And that's why one day you will appear with Him in His glory. Why is that? Because that's where you are now. You're in Him and in His glory that He shared with you. 
And that's going to have an effect. We saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. How often? Are you sure? Could you use some more convincing sometimes? Yes, I can too. It's, it's a good thing that God convinces me and thinks it's a, I think it's a sort of a hobby with God and me. Oh, look, Ralph has doubts again today. Let's drive him out. He loves it. Never gets tired of that, of convincing me that I'm free, that I have grace and life from him. So, here's the question we've been looking at that frames other questions, and it's what would I do if I knew, and there's a blank that goes with that. What would I do if I knew? Not as a way of legalism or getting it right. It's just if I knew it, if I really believed it, if God convinced me about something from the truth, of the truth, what would that look like? What might that look like for me? And it may be unique to you. It's not prescriptive of of, of this is what you've got to do. It's descriptive. The difference is huge. It's a freeing thing so that you can know, oh, this is actually who, the truth. This is actually who I am with him and him with me. Therefore, I might do this thing. I might go that way. So that's the question. And here's our question, first one for today. What would I do if I knew that suffering came with out-of-this-world benefits? Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, gosh, is this a suffering message? Dich. Came the wrong Sunday, I can tell you that. This is really good news. You're going to like it. Maybe not the suffering part, but what you find because of the suffering. I know there's a whole lot of fear, and there's a whole lot of suffering. Some of it very quiet uh, that's going on in our days. But have you ever heard or read that we're supposed to rejoice in suffering? Have you heard that one? Rejoice in suffering. Like if we're good Christians, we'll act all happy, kind of cheerleadery when life is bad, difficult, and painful. Um, many of us think, uh, we, we know about that verse, rejoice, rejoice. We know that's true, but we wonder why. What for? And maybe, some, maybe you know someone who did the whole cheerleadery thing. I know it's bad, but isn't it good? And you thought, that's weird, I don't want that. Well, this is the thing you actually have and want and you'll like. So there's another question that's not on the screen, but why rejoice in suffering? Whatever for? That's a good question, isn't it? If we're supposed to rejoice in suffering, why? What for? Well, for starters, it's very common that we do not see ourselves as in Christ, but as separate from Him. Maybe walking alongside of him on the beach. Um, That's a problem because the new covenant speaks more of our being in him, in Christ, than it speaks of of his being in us. Both are true, but there's a lot more given to us being in him, secure in him. So that's, it's a problem if we don't think about ourselves being actually in him. I know spiritually it's invisible, but it's still true. If we don't pay much attention to that, then Satan and the world will conspire to see ourselves outside of him, separate from him, and oh boy, have you got a lot to do. You better think right, do right, behave right, and it's all upside down from there. So if we don't know about this or think about ourselves where we are in Christ, that's going to hurt. That's going to injure us. And people are very nervous then about suffering for Jesus. And if they don't think of themselves as in Christ, I don't blame them. If the, if the clipboard came, came, came through the rows today and it said, sign up for suffering for Jesus tomorrow, would you put your name on there? <laughs> no, no. Would you make it maybe look like you were? Oh, and then <laughs> on it goes. Yeah. We'd get it back, and it probably would be blank. I don't blame you. It makes sense. I'd be nervous about that. I'd feel vulnerable and exposed if I didn't think of myself as in Him. The truth is that we have a new location, a new address that is out of this world with benefits in keeping with that. He is in us, but we are in Him. 
So suffering that God permits, think of yourself where you are, in Him, suffering that God permits is not directed at us as though we will somehow become better for the suffering. If we rejoice enough, if we get it just right, but suffering is not a penalty, suffering is not a goal, nor is suffering something that God hopes we'll get through and by which we will get better. The sufferings of Christ at the cross have had already an awful lot to do with making us better, in fact, as good as we can get. So that's not why God's doing it. But something happens to us through suffering. Something is produced in us and and through us that shows something very important. It's this. Suffering shows where God is. And it shows how good He is where He is. And that we're together by design in suffering. That's why it can be valuable. It shows where God is and how He is where He is in and through suffering. So the target, I could, if I could say it this way, the bullseye of undeserved suffering is Jesus. And that happens to be your location. It's where you are. It's in Him. He's the target. Suffering is directed at... Where are you? In Him. Suffering that comes at you is actually first going at... Him, Jesus. And what does He plan to do? Well, He plans to be Himself with you and in you. That's the plan, and that's your hope. Christ in me, in suffering. And while we will grow in confidence about who we are and where we are in Jesus, the purpose and hope for suffering is that Christ in us may be made evident to us and to others, and that He'll be revealed as living in us. Ta-da! Shock! That's good for us, and that's good for other people to see. So suffering gets at Christ, who is perfect for every need that suffering might put upon us. I'm thrilled to find Christ in me any way I can. I bet you are too, even through suffering, maybe especially through suffering, since the life and grace of Christ in me redeems an otherwise ugly and awful and painful and traumatic and I could go on situation. Who doesn't like finding Christ on the inside? It's good to know that Christ is out there, but what's better? That one out there or in here? I'll take in here every day. Because out here, he doesn't seem very useful. He doesn't do a whole lot out there sometimes that I can see, but in here, that's everything. It's my favorite especially in suffering. And that is why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Where will the glory be revealed? Huh. And as we said last week, that's not in the sweet by and by in heaven. It's now. The evidence of God in you, that is your hope in suffering. That is life. That's what Paul's talking about. These present sufferings are not worthless. There's a worth, there's a value, and you're going to discover how good that is. Consider the following, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. As By the way, this word test doesn't mean Oh gosh, I wonder if you'll pass or fail. It means to prove you, to make sure that God who is in there, He's going to show Himself to you. So God, at the end of the trial, the end of the suffering, can say, told you, showed you. He's proving it. So, um, fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. This word participate is to share, to koinonia. If you don't know that He's in you, if you don't know how secure you are in Him, again, the clipboard comes around, I'm passing, thank you very much. I don't want anything to do with it. But inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, His sufferings, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Where is His glory going to be revealed? 
in you. Because you try hard? Mm-hmm. No. Because you're ready to, you, you're, be, you're beginning to believe, or you are believing that he's in here, he's going to do something. So you look within to find him. Whose sufferings were the people of God enduring? Well, they weren't theirs. Did they probably feel like they were theirs? Oh, yes. And that's where the confusion can plague us. Well, it feels like it's me. In fact, it is me. It must just be me. And God would say, wait, you're in me and I'm in you and I'm going to prove it. It's not for you. It's not your fault. You didn't do this. This is completely undeserved, but it's coming at you, but it's coming first at me so that I can respond and be glorified in you through Christ is the order. It felt like theirs, their sufferings, but they were Jesus' sufferings, and they thought of them like that so that he could respond to them in him. This is huge with God, and it's huge with us. That's why they were going to be overjoyed. They weren't going to be overjoyed because they were obeying a command. Look here, my sons and daughters. Be overjoyed when bad stuff happens. Have a happy attitude. That's not why. That's not it at all. They were going to find Christ in me, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. And the onlookers, the fans gathered in the stadium seats to watch the supernatural bowl, if you'll allow me, that was happening in Christians. They were seeing Christ in them, and we're going to see Christ in us. It's the same way today. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now, I've had people quote that verse to me after I'd been heavily, heavy, heavily insulted for the name of Christ, and they would do this, oh, you're blessed. And what did I want to do? If that's blessed, I'm going to wring your neck or something else. I was not happy to be told, hey, just be cheerful, right? That's that rejoice thing. Put on your, your, your cheerleader outfit and be happy. No, that's not why. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief um, or any other kind of uh, a, a criminal or even as a meddler. Well, that, that just makes sense because he's not involved in that stuff. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with God's household. This is not a judgment to see if you make the heavenly cut. That's not what that word means. This is, this is a judgment or a proof that people are going to be seeing this going on and they'll be able to go, oh, I judge that something's different there. I see it. I get it. I know it. And that's going to be different. And out of this world, something's different going on in them. So outsiders are judging this. And that's what he's talking about. And if it begins with us, what's, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, they don't believe. They don't have God in them. And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, that doesn't mean good luck. That means challenging. It means that you, you want to know the truth. You want to know Christ in you because it's going to be hard, this whole salvation thing. You've got it. You're in. You're good. You're seated in heavenly places. You're not getting out of there. You're in Christ. He's not going to go out. You're in. But it's difficult. It can be challenging. So if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become or, of the ungodly and the sinner? It's another story. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator. And where is he? Aha. So is this a pledge of obedience? No. This is a, well, you're in here. You're in me and I'm in you. We're together in this. So, I'm committing myself to you. I know what you're doing. I know what's going on. I want to see you in me. I want to know what you're like in me. And then continue to do good. But do the first thing first. Well, Lord, you're in me. I'm not alone. Never be alone. I'm in you. We're secure. 
This has to be for your glory, and I sure hope it is. So this suffering you'll see on the screen, this suffering according to God's will attracts us not to a performance that we're supposed to work up and carry out, but to God who lives in us and who works through us. He is revealed both to us and to our audience. Is that clear? That's why. That's what this is for. God thinks that's true, and He'd love to help you see it's true, so that you would know you're not alone, and it isn't about a performance you drum up in suffering, it's for Him with you. That's a good thing. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's um, afflictions for the sake of His body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present you the Word of God in its fullness, the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the, to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. This is what he's doing. Paul is talking about, well, I want to understand and, and sort of welcome the sufferings of Christ in this body of, of him and me, in this flesh, in this world, so that he can do in me what would be great for the church and the not yet church. I want Christ in me to do what he's here to do in me uniquely. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a big deal for God. All right, our next question. What would I do if I knew that the word submit is not a bad word? So, so far, we have a couple of lovely words, suffering and submit. Aren't they great? Yeah, but they're going to be good. They'll, they'll, this is also a very good word if you know what it means. It's not a command to be a doormat. It's not a command to just bow down and, oh, you know, suck it up and be good. It's something way better. I, I might have said before that when reciting... Um, Sarah, my wife, reciting her wedding vows to me, she said these words, I promise to submit myself to you. And Sarah's mother later told us, she went, and, but a few minutes later, what did I do? I said the same thing. I promise to submit myself to you. And Sarah's mother said, she went, okay, that might be a little better, good. So there's this word, <clears throat> submit. How does it grab you? What if I say it this way, submit? Ah. That's not how it is for us. It's way better than that. So I want to give you a couple of not-so-popular Bible verses uh, to consider today as you wonder if submission is a good thing with God, if it's good, not just because I, I get out of the way, but because God's good in me, what is it? Why is it good? I want to know about it. So Holy Spirit, I'm open to what you would show me why this is good with you in me for the days ahead. First Peter chapter one, uh, 2, verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Anybody happy with that passage? Told you it's not popular. If you're an American, then it's very likely that you've got thoughts and feelings about our current king. Anybody? And if we consider the king previous to him, well, just about everybody in our country has had thoughts about our kings, our, our presidents. It's not, uh, uh, there's a cringe factor that goes on in us, if I could say it that way, when we think of submitting ourselves to the governing authorities. It's challenging for us. Uh, but here's the thing, 
Paul's command for submission is not a, a, lone, uh, a standalone demand of surrender, as though God loves a great capitulation. I just love it when they all give up. That's not what this is. That's not godly submission, not at all. New covenant submission always comes loaded with reasons why, whatever for, and great benefits for the one who submits. On the screen, you'll see whether submitting to a worldly authority, to a spouse, or to one another in relationships, offering myself in deference to another, is so that I can be aware of God in me, for me, and for the situation I'm in. That's why. I shall see in a minute. Submission is yet another way to know and to enjoy God in me and for His kingdom in me to collide with and to affect the kingdom of this world. Where's God in you? Wouldn't it be good if He affected the kingdom of this world? This is that. That's what this is about. Jesus never did or said anything except what he saw and heard the Father do and say. He was tuned in to the Father. Walking around, it wasn't legalistic, I must have quiet time, quality time with God. That was not it. He was just open to the Father, tuned in as he did his, as he ate sat around the fire, went fishing, did the stuff that he did. He was just tuned in. And he's given us an amazing example of submission in dire circumstances because of his awareness of God, the Father, and the effect that was to come of being aware of God and in submission to him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 reads this way. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. What if you stopped right there? Do that. Don't stop there. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. The entrusted himself part made all the difference. And why did Jesus submit himself to the cross? Let's get to that. Was it sheer obedience? No, it was not. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 tells us that he did it for the joy set before him, the bringing of many sons to God. He did it for a reason. Aha, I know what's coming. I get it. Oh, I'm doing this because of that. Does that make sense? This is another way to know God. Yes, around you, but most importantly, God in you. So he endured the cross. He scorned its shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we're told to consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's the hope. The only way we won't grow weary and lose heart in submission is if we do it for the same reason Jesus did. It's the only way I've ever found. Human Jesus submitted to unjust torture and torment because he was knowing the Father who revealed to Jesus the joy set before him. Jesus knew. That resulted in faith that led to obedience. Aha, I get it. You're doing this. Okay. Then I'll do this. Knowing God keeps us from becoming well, uh, weary in well-doing. That's the thing. That's what keeps us, if, if people just go have, have a power bar so you don't become weary and well-doing, that's not Christian, it's not anti-Christian, but that's not life by Christ. This is life by Christ. Anybody can do, um, anybody can do well-doing, but it's the knowing God part that produces grace that's perfect for that moment and that time. Hebrews tells us why Jesus did it. Verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything 
that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Where's Jesus? And that's a big deal. He's in us, in you, in fa by faith. Let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. If you see Jesus in you like this, let's go. Let's do it. We can do this, you and I. That's not a bad picture. That's how he is. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endure, endured such opposition from sinners that you won't go weary. So you won't. And lose heart. So we're not to go blind and unfeeling into submission. Submission by itself is not our example. Awareness of God plus submission is Jesus' example for life. Don't just grit your teeth through suffering. Know God in you who will keep you from becoming weary. That's what he does. Jesus walked knowingly into submission, or, uh, and, and he reaped the grace-sufficient benefit of living by faith that something good and greater was happening right then. God was happening. The Father was happening through and with Jesus, and Jesus was aware of him. He knew it, and that propelled him into the most loving, submissive act ever in history. This is why when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said this in Ephesians 5.21, it's not on the screen, he wrote this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What a verse. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Does that mean because Jesus is over there watching? No, it doesn't mean that. God is in us. That's why. So because God is in us, we go out amongst people and give ourselves to them, and we see what happens. More accurately, we see how God happens in us toward them. There's every chance that God in you wants to, is going to do something with that person or this situation or that thing. It's what keeps us from becoming weary in well-doing or just doing well-doing because dang it, I'm supposed to. It saves us from that. This is walking by the Spirit who makes everything adventurous every day. And our attention remains upon God, not who's over there watching and grading, but God who is in here. And the Spirit reveals that because we're in, God, in Christ, we're in Him, we're safe, we're secure, and God is in us for an effect. It's the greatest thing. Last question. What would I do if I knew that I didn't have to worry at all about my righteousness, holiness, or my ability to redeem myself? What if I didn't have to worry at all about that? Would that be good? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. Look what I did! All on my own for you. Don't bother. Verse 30. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Aha. Relocated and everything. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus who has become smart from God. In other words, this is what I'm doing. It's this thing. I'm really smart about this. I'm a brainiac. He says this. He's become wisdom from God. That is, he has become our righteousness. He has become our holiness, and He has become our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is not then something, you better be sure and be careful about boasting in God and not in yourself. Don't you do it. No, this is, He's become all this for you. He's become your righteousness. He's become your holiness. He's become your redemption. 
He's become all of it. And if you know that and, and grow in believing it, what are you going to end up doing? Boasting about God. It's not a, you better, it's not a stance you're supposed to take. I'm going to boast. I'm going to boast. It's not that. It's a, hey, in light of all of this, that he did this life he's given you, this grace he's given you, this freedom he's working to give you and make sure you have all the time. Experience that. Know that. And then you're safe from fear. If and as we forget that Jesus is our righteousness, that he is our holiness, that he is our redemption, and instead try for our own, we can't boast in the Lord. Not really. We can't do it. And in the end, we, we, we end up growing dark on the inside. I'm not doing well. It's not going well. I've failed him so many times. So much. We, maybe we think, look, I've tried to pray more. I, I, I'm trying to read more. I'm trying to be more loving. I'm trying to be nice and patient. I'm trying to do all this stuff, and it's not, I've pledged to read the Bible through in a year. I've pledged to be nicer and kinder and more gentle. I've pledged, I've purposed, I've done all these things. I don't do very well with that. Ah. But what if he is all that? What if he is that? And we've just been looking in the wrong place. What if we start from faith that he is our righteousness? To begin with, and to continue, our holiness, our being sanctified in Him, safe in Him for all things. And, and for our redemption, our ability to rescue is not with us. It's with Him. Maybe you've thought things like this. I am going to have a better prayer life. I'm going to do it. Have, any, have Anybody? I'm going to do it. How's that gone? And I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that there's things we do. We say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this better prayer life. I'm going to do this better thing. And it falls apart. That's a big one, our prayer life. I, should, I, I was going to pray a day, an hour a day, 10 minutes a day, a minute. I forgot. I didn't do it right. What is that doing? It's boasting in my righteousness and trying to have better righteousness. What does that mean? I don't believe that he is all of that for me. He is the better prayer life. He is the righteousness of it all. He is the one who does it for me. I, I don't start, people will say, well, I'm going to start praying again. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, this time I'm going to do it. As if they're starting from ground zero. Or maybe negative, because they've made the promise before. <laughs> but with God, you will never start from negative. You will never start from zero. You always start from full up. It's all yours. You have it all to begin with. God will never say, yeah, you know, that. Uh, oh, no, sorry, you got a long way to go to get back. No, you don't, ever. He has become your righteous prayer life. He has become your righteous, I'm not going to sin anymore. That sin you've been trying to stop, he's your freedom. It's him. He's your righteousness. He's your holiness. He's your rescue. This is another way of saying redemption. It's Him, and you have Him to the full. Jesus is the prized possession who relieves us of covetousness. He's the confidence and love who drives out fear. He is the satisfaction who releases us from lust, the reward who delivers us from selfish ambition the sin and burden bearer who takes from us the crushing weight of failure and loss that no amount of counsel otherwise could. In every way, he's our Savior, ongoing. On the screen, I want to be happy and enjoy love, peace, and self-control, but none of that is achieved. It's supplied over and over again with him who lives, and because I'm secure in him, being made faultless and blameless in the body of Jesus himself, I have all things at all times, him in me and through me. It's not an achievement that I'm looking for, it's a person. Knowing Jesus and friendship with him is the way to that supply over and over again. 
because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our starting point all the time. This is why we boast in the Lord, not because we're supposed to, but because we believe he is perfectly capable for us. The end of our strife, the end of our struggle, the end of it, the solution for it, him who lives in us. God didn't choose you because you would be brave and not have any fears or weaknesses one day, but because he would make you free to express them to him. So his love and grace would drive out fear and be strong for you in that day. This is how he earns his glory with you. Knowing God really is as simple and wonderful as noticing his life and effect in you. He's like this. He's loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, meek, and always himself with you. This is another way of saying self-control. He's always like that. He's always the same way with you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, if you wonder where I got that. He never loses control. And whenever you've got any of that fruit, that evidence going on, you're getting him. You're knowing him. Listen, hearing his voice or having his thoughts come pounding into your brain from God and you know it is not m- more knowing God than knowing the fruit of his presence. Love, joy, peace, patience. That's also knowing God. So maybe you've been tricked into thinking, I never hear God. I never get his words. Oh, it's... you don't need that. Do you have all of that? Do you ever have joy? How about peace? How about patience? How about any of that? That's knowing God in you. So here's a final thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to have you read. Maybe consider saying it out loud. In fact, I'll give you a moment to read it. So that there's, have you ever had that where someone said, hey, would repeat, repeat with me the following and you don't know what the following is? What if it's, I hate myself and I hate you too? I mean, you don't know. So let's give it a quick look. And if you think, huh, that's actually, that might be true. Then let's tee it up and say it together. After the new birth of the new creation me, it is all of him and all of me. It will never be all of him and none of me as though God wants me out of the way. I am his way. I am perfectly compatible with him who lives in me just as he intended. 